This is our final research seminar for winter term. And I will be announcing the speakers and topics for our spring term series uh, next week. So I'm hope that hopeful that you will join our spring series. I'm also pleased to introduce Karen Hooker, who is a professor of our in our college, and she's the Joanne Leonard Peterson Endowed Chair in Gerontology and Family Studies. That's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. um, she mm -hmm. has graciously agreed to introduce today's speakers. We got speakers and moderate this session and facilitate the discussion. And she'll also provide more information about the format of this um, Zoom pre or this webinar. So without taking any more time, let's get going. So um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Hooker. Karen, oh. it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Well, welcome everybody to this week's seminar, Living on the Edge, an American Generation's Journey Through the 20th Century. Here's the great book. This recently published book by a trio of well-known and distinguished scholars is really a close-up view and analysis of how the rapid technological changes and major historical events like the Great Depression, two world wars, shaped the lives of Americans in the last century and also have ripple effects into current times. The social changes and uncertainties they experienced parallel in many ways conditions we're faced with today. So the authors and panel presenters are our own Rick Setterston, who is the Barbara E. Knudsen Endowed Chair and Distinguished Professor of Human Development and Family Sciences here at Oregon State. He serves as head of the School of Social and Behavioral Health Sciences in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences and is the founding director of the Hallie E. Ford Center for Healthy Children and Families. His work includes, um, his research areas include the life course, social relationships, historical experiences and social change, parenthood and family life, and social policy. Welcome Glenn. Glenn Elder is the Odom Distinguished Research Professor of Sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is really the founding father of life course theory, methods, and research. So we're delighted to have him with us here today. The book we will be discussing today perfectly exemplifies his research as he studies individuals and groups of people with in-depth interviews and other measurements across different times in their lifespans investigating how changing environments and historical events have influenced their lives. Welcome Lisa. Lisa Pierce is the Zachary Taylor Smith Distinguished Term Professor in the Department of Sociology and a faculty fellow at the Carolina Population Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on religious and family dynamics from adolescence through the transition to adulthood. She has ongoing research in the US, Nepal, and Kenya. Her work mixes survey and semi-structured interview methods, and she writes and teaches about mixed methods research. So we welcome all of you to our college research seminar, and we're very excited to hear your thoughts on the book today. For audience members, we've built in plenty of time for Q&A. So um, since it is a webinar, not a Zoom, you won't be able to pop in with questions, but you can put your questions as they occur to you in the Q&A and I'll be monitoring that. Um, so then I will ask the questions, but you can put them in the Q&A. And then we'll also be announcing the winner of the book raffle at the very end of the session. So now it's my pleasure to turn it over to the panel. Thanks, Karen. Um, let me get us started. I, I just wanted to say that this is um, such a special session for me, um, not only because uh, so many of you here uh, in, in the session are, are good friends and students and colleagues, um, but it's also a special moment for me to share these two uh, uh, dear friends uh, with all of you. In our decade-long journey, we've had um, we've had a, a quite a ride, and it's been been great fun. And I, I'm I'm thrilled that we can all be here today to participate in the session. Um, and thanks to Karen for moderating. So um, basically, the blueprint is that uh, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn, who's going to say a little something about the story of the project, how the book came about. Um, and then I will probably just say something about uh, why we see the book as significant and, and provide a few details about the study. And then we'll each just spend a few minutes 
trying to illuminate uh, one of the, a, a key theme uh, from the book. So that's the game plan. We're hoping to uh, come in somewhere around half an hour uh, time so that we've got Q&A um, a time uh, for what we hope will be uh, an in interesting discussion. So Glenn, why don't you uh, take it away? And while you start, I'm going to pull up the uh, PowerPoint. Thank you, Rick. It's a pleasure to, to be back uh, in this way to uh, Oregon State and uh, to open up uh, the story of um, our project, which has really been underway for a long time, <clears throat> as you will see. My interest um, <clears throat> in studying an older generation came up in 1972 as I completed Children of the Great Depression at the Berkeley Institute of Human Development. And of course this book, Children, uh, took a long time to, uh, to uh, reach publication, 10 years. But I think that's the way it goes when you're work working with archival data. And that's the story that uh, we will probably won't say an awful lot about here but it's something that really is important to talk about uh, to understand what uh, uh, this work um, involves. And we have, interestingly, uh, so much more archival data today than, uh, of course, uh, the founders of uh, Children of the Great Depression, uh, the archive uh, there, uh, was launched uh, in the in the 30s, uh, and um, now we have dozens and dozens and hundreds of longitudinal studies. We all need to know how to work with it, uh, or how to make uh, sense of those materials. Um, Children of the Great Depression uh, was based on uh, the Oakland. Uh, cohort, born in 1920-21, uh, and they were followed in the middle age. But what I found there was that um, we had virtually no information on their parents, either going back or going forward. Uh, and so it was, we, we had a great story on the children, this this uh, cohort, but nothing to speak of on the parents. <clears throat> to fill this gap, I turned to the Institute's, Berkeley Institute's longitudinal study and discovered an amazing feature, especially at that time in terms of um, the 20s and the 30s. Uh, this study um, directed by Jean McFarland remarkable person in herself, uh, in her own career, uh, had observed both parents and their study child across their lives. That, in my understanding of the field, had not really been done by any other uh, project at that time. And it's hard enough to follow one person across, or one, one parent, parents across time or the children across time, but to do both of them was quite an undertaking. And especially at a time when we had very little support for longitudinal studies. Um, the, uh, having, having a book in mind uh, as I, uh, uh, got involved in this, um, I began developing chapters on this generation in 1973. Um, and I continued working on one chapter after another into the next century. But I was doing, of course, a lot of other things. It just uh, took a long time to work with archival materials. Uh, in 2010, I realized I wasn't getting younger and I needed collaborators on my project. And that's when I 
got in touch with Rick and Lisa, and they were my uh, primary interest right then. And I was so happy when they were uh, agreeable to jump into this complicated project and to uh, uh, add so much to it. Uh, Rick has uh, done a great deal of work on studying people across their lives uh, and in a life course way. And Lisa is known for her uh, insightful work on families and gender. And, and we're following people across many years. And I worried about are we up to date in terms of understanding these, these people and the changes they were going through? Um, I look forward then to their contributions to this project. And um, I want to close by simply uh, saying that there are always peak experiences in a project like this. And I think we had one um, uh, at the very beginning, in 2012, we got together uh, at the American Sociological Association meeting in Denver with the aim of uh, reading and dis or discussing all of the chapters that had been uh, worked up and keep an eye open for new chapters that um, needed, needed to be added to the set that were already present. And so we gathered after reading the chapters and I'll never forget the liveliness and the exuberance of our meeting. And I think the, the photographs that you see on this slide, our story, tell a story. I think we got a great deal out of this. It was a great beginning to take off and we outlined the book and uh, the book is now out and uh, we're very pleased about it. Thank you. Excellent, thanks Glenn. Um, let me uh, say a couple things about why we uh, see this book as important. Um, the first is really that it addresses this, um, this big theme about how a rapidly changing world affects human lives. How, we, how social change leaves people unsettled and disoriented, how it demands that they adapt to and cope with change, how it alters lives in ways that are often profound and often unforeseen. And for us, this also uh, was especially relevant in our own era of accelerating discord and, uh, and change. Second, it captures a rarely studied generation, what we're calling the 1900 generation of Americans. This generation encountered what Robert Gordon called a century of revolutionary change. As Karen already noted, their lives were marked by migration, by wartime, by great swings in economic prosperity uh, and depression, by unimaginable advances in, um, in science and technology. As one person associated with the study said in the 1980s, never again will history equal the rate of change of this period from covered wagons to the moon. And uh, to us, it just so nicely capture, captures the, the kind of vast and profound change that this generation saw. We're gonna to refer to this generation as, a, as what Leonard Kane once called a hinge generation. That is that their lives are going to be really drastically different from the generations before them. And they're going to instigate and put into motion this, and, and, and a set of changes that are gonna echo through the rest of the century. Um, this is gonna be true in lots of areas. Um, uh, significant changes in the nature of work, uh, the growing separation of workplaces from the home, uh, the expansion of higher education, married women's increasing labor force participation, greater egalitarianism in marriage, um, and also uh, how they go about the business of parenting. So there are gonna be lots of ways that we're gonna see them as being so markedly different from what came before. And again, uh, echoing, starting to uh, a set of changes that are gonna echo in subsequent generations. As Glenn said, it's a pathbreaking lifelong study. In that sense, because we're tracing the lives of these people over uh, the, the arc of the century, they're, they're intersecting with so many of those profound uh, social changes we were talking about. And finally, 
the book is going to challenge some conventional wisdom we have about the life course. Um, that is that so much of what we take for granted about the life today, uh, our lives today, we assume sort of got started in the wake of World War II. Um, and for sure, that was a pivotal period uh, in, in, in how the life course gets re reconfigured. Um, but data so often rely on, um, I mean, our studies rely so often on, on data that were gathered from the 1950s forward, and we often can't see uh, uh, what life was like uh, in the first half of the century. And, um, and we're going to be able to see that in this, in this study. So let me make just a couple of quick comments about the Berkeley study and the archives. Um, there you see Jean McFarland in the upper right-hand corner. Glenn mentioned her as, the, as, a, as a revolutionary, and she was in so many ways, the founder of this, this study. Um, so the couples who enter this study all had a child between 1928 and 29. That's the most important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, and uh, that then means that as we study the parents, they're, gonna, um, they're going to uh, have birth dates that range from 1885 all the way to 1908. There'll be periodic data collection very intensively from 28 to 47, but then again in 69 and again in the early 80s. And there are going to be some analytic distinctions that are going to be important to us, of course, gender, because the scripts for men's and women's lives are dramatically different at this time. Um, social class is important to keep in mind, too, because 60% uh, of the sample was middle class, 40% uh, working class. Um, contrast and social class are going to be important, but so are contrast in deprivation, that is how much people lost uh, during the depression decade in particular. The generational status uh, of, of the individuals in the context of an extended family and the cohort status of, um, of um, these folks in the context of historical time. And here we often contrast um, the people who were born before 1900 and the people who were born uh, after, because that also allows us to get a little more precisely at um, his, uh, the different experiences of historical event, events and changes in their lives. Um, all right, and finally, um, I want to introduce this quote on behalf of all of us, because it so often was a touchstone um, as we uh, made our way through this decade of collaboration. <laughs> um, we love this quote, and we open the book with it um, and give it more treatment there. But the quote is, we are unsettled to the very roots of our being. We have no precedence to guide us, no wisdom that wasn't made for a simpler age. We've changed our environment more quickly than we know how to change ourselves. These words might be written by any one of us in, the, in, the, in this Zoom call today, um, but uh, they're actually written by uh, an American uh, social commentator, um, and journalist and writer, uh, Walter Lippmann, who um, wrote these words in the book, Drift in Mastery in 1914, which comes out on the eve of World War I. But for us, it just signals, he was himself a member of this, this generation. And, it, and again, just sort of signals this, this profound um, sense and often timeless sense that, um, that we, we live amid a set of changes that um, leave us um, uh, uh, feeling disoriented. Um, on that note, I'm going to just uh, turn to a couple of these uh, conversation starters. Um, Lisa will take the first one on the gender navigation of work and family. Glenn will talk a bit about how life paths matter for um, health and well-being in later life. And I'll say something about uh, the past and later life. So let me now turn to Lisa. Great, thanks. All right, so how the 1900 generation navigated work and family demands through the Great Depression and World War II is really interesting and very prescient in our current pandemic affected world. The 1900 generation, they came of age in a time and place where opportunities for paid work and career development were abundant for men and unmarried women. Opportunities varied by social class and gender, but with the median age of marriage in the mid 20s, it wasn't uncommon to experience gainful employment in young adulthood. When they married and had children, the women almost universally quit working to focus on the domestic sphere. 
Some interpret this as a choice to return to traditional women's roles, but that's too simplistic for a couple of reasons. First, there wasn't much choice in it. Women were socialized to expect this transition and feel rewarded by it, and society was structured in a way that required it. Second, these women on the heels of having secured the right to vote saw their potential for innovation in the domestic sphere. They found their purpose in and expressed agency by redefining marriage as more companionate and parenthood as science driven. As one woman described her shift into the domestic sphere, she said, I wouldn't have wanted anything else. And a lot of women around me felt the same. They were there to raise their families, bring up good kids and feed them correctly. I never saw any unhappiness. Everybody was family conscious. Then men worked intensively outside of the home, many in factories or firms. They struggled to meet expectations at work and at home. As one of the men in the study said, when a husband and wife are separated a lot, as usually happens nowadays because of the nature of the husband's work, they tend to grow apart. He continued, in the small town where I grew up, Men mostly worked on their own small farms or in little shops, and husbands and wives were always in each other's company. So how couples managed the tension of these newly separating spheres, work and family, set the stage for how well they navigated the impending shocks of the Great Depression and World War II. During the Great Depression, of course, many men lost their jobs or had hours cut. It was hardest on families who were already having trouble make, making ends meet. Um, but in rare cases where well-off families lost entire incomes um, from men's work, the dramatic deprivation um, and change in social station were consequential for marital relationships. Across the social class spectrum, men's loss of wages was hard on those who fixed their identities in breadwinning. And women, on the other hand, they could fulfill their identities as caretakers by finding solutions. The female service jobs they had worked prior to marriage were often more available than men's jobs at that point. When men could be pragmatic and appreciate women's work and sacrifices, marriages seemed strengthened. Discussing these times in their interviews, men said things like, money was money, or we didn't have time to worry about whether women should work. But when men were resentful of women working, marriages suffered. When considering the effects of World War II on women, uh, many envisioned Rosie the Riveter and widespread move of women into manual labor. But in fact, those women were largely younger and unmarried. And the 1900 generation women were in their 30s and 40s and they filled jobs left behind by the Rosies. Um, one woman, woman said, I did secretarial work during the war. That's what I had done before having kids. I could help a little and earn some money. It felt kind of patriotic. So women managed work and domestic responsibilities, again, with help from family members and now with some federally subsidized daycare. Uh, when these women look back on their work during World War II, they're nostalgic. One said, I shouldn't say this, but I had a ball, mm -hmm. referring to the camaraderie among um, the women she was working with and all the money she was making. She, she had doubled her salary. So there are a couple key takeaways from the 1900 generation experiences I've described for how we think about families today. First, work family pathways are less about choice and preference than we sometimes think. Individuals make use of available structures and exert agency largely within them. Also socioeconomic status modifies the experience of challenging times, something we see all too clearly in our current crisis. Then um, lives unfold in a dynamic fashion. So static categories or types of individuals think stay at home or working mom or family structure at any one point are less helpful than observing the linked pathways of experience, the ups and downs over time and how people relate to each other. Uh, finally, family members either adapt to ruptures of daily life with pragmatism and communicate towards a common goal or 
they risk their own well being and their family relationships. Great. So, next, Glenn will uh, say a little something about um, how life paths matter for health and well being in later life. And he's going to pay uh, special attention to the connection between economic hardship and emotional stress. May right? I ask how much, uh, where we are time wise? Oh, I don't know, take about five minutes, maybe. Okay, <laughs> right. Okay, that's <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> um, We're a little behind, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I, um, what I thought I would do is uh, provide um, a long-term picture of hardship and health for men and women. Um, and um, then go on to the relationship between the Great Depression and uh, World War II and the work uh, life experiences, especially of, of men um, as they move from one to the other. Um, in the Depression, uh, we find overall that men lost some emotional health, while women typically gained in health. And if you walk that all the way through to the, the end of um, the, the 60s, for example, around 1970, um, some analysis we did shows that um, 30 years after hardship among some 40 surviving couples, wives emerged as more agentic and resilient than their husbands. And I think, um, and I've mentioned over the, over the uh, presentations that uh, the, um, the work-life mandate, uh, the breadwinner mandate that uh, men experienced played a major role in the negative health outcomes that men uh, experienced across the, the 30s and into the war years. Um, many times uh, workers from, staff workers from the Institute would visit families and find husbands crushed by um, their experience, their inability to support their family ashamed uh, to even show their face in some cases uh, in their communities. And um, there was no way out for them. Uh, and so they carried this heavy burden uh, and it was very hard on families. Uh, wives uh, had no idea of how to respond to this situation. Uh, and um, so it, it was the story, uh, the rigidity of uh, expectations focused on both men and women, women uh, in terms of homemaking and men in terms of uh, breadwinning. Um, in terms of the connection between the Great Depression and, and uh, World War II, think of the working class where you had uh, the concentration of unemployment. So some of the men reflecting on their experiences uh, would say that um, the depression years were a time where we had no work uh, and we, suffered, we had to pay for that in terms of not inability to support the family. But moving to the, to the war years, uh, they faced nothing but work uh, and very long hours, very uh, uh, challenging work. The pace of work increased. Uh, and uh, one of the stories coming out of this, or one of the, the figures that I, I'm always um, struck by is that um, more people, more workers died um, uh, in their 
in their jobs um, than people uh, working or serving in the war. That is, World War II uh, didn't produce uh, as more men who lost their lives than um, we found in, in, in the States. The high cost of um, work was experienced at all levels, uh, both working class and in the, um, the management of firms where they had to produce. And the, that pressure to produce filtered all the way down to the lowest level. Uh, but many of these men died at very young ages. Uh, and that's, I think, the major theme I, I want to uh, convey. The, um, the hardship that uh, was experienced by both men and women. Uh, men were faced by this pressure uh, to support the family, even when circumstances were so difficult that they had to they had no way to go to the, no place to go except to get um, welfare support, and that was enormously hard for many of them. We have uh, descriptions of a man going finally to the uh, welfare office, um, but deciding to walk around the block because he couldn't get the nerve and the the courage to go in and. And, and sign up for, for the money to support his family. So that's what I, I think is the, what I'll leave with you on, on the uh, work situation, uh, especially focused on the men who um, uh, had such difficulty coping during this period. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks, Glenn. So um, let me just, I'll, I'll quickly do this. We close the book. So Glenn was just talking about the way in which the prior life paths make a difference for health and well-being in late life. We close the book actually also by drawing on some retrospective data um, of, these, of these people looking back on their lives and talking about the things that matter, the, the most trying times, the most satisfying times, uh, reflecting on their marriages and the like. As Glenn said, um, we, we also... Um, uh, we see that the, by the time they're uh, uh, close to 70 and then and especially close to 80, um, you know, you see that the survival rate of women um, far surpasses that of men. And um, we can talk about some of the reasons why that, that might be. Um, uh, but, it, but what that means is the story of the later years, especially the very latest years, is really um, a story of women. Um, yeah, that's right. And... Um, uh, well, actually, before I go on to this point about grandparenting, uh, the issue of women is, is uh, important by, by uh, 6970, by that follow-up, about 75% of the women had lost their husbands um, or divorced, but only 5% had divorced uh, by that time. And so lar largely uh, a group of widows, a large group of widows. Um, and um, in the early 80s, actually, this group of people was studied by the... Um, by the well-known psychologist, uh, psychoanalyst, Eric Erickson, um, uh, uh, who uh, focused a little bit on, on, on their own aging. Um, as part of that, um, he, um, he really saw and discovered that grandparenting for these people had become a major uh, source of meaning um, and, uh, and a source of what he called vital involvement in old age. Um, and um, a kind of gateway to um, generational continuity and generativity, so you would expect that. Of course, um, as these women are growing older, their family worlds are getting smaller, not only because they're losing husbands, but they're losing siblings as well. And yet relationships with children and with friends become really primary sources of meaning uh, for these women. And that's gonna be especially true of women who experience significant hardship um, earlier in life. Um, there are going to be a couple key themes for women. Uh, one is about education and the women who talked to, uh, who had college experience, especially talked about how schools and access to higher education mattered in their life pathways. Um, and those who didn't go on uh, to college or hadn't completed it, um, 
really looked back uh, with with regret and a sense of loss uh, that they that they uh, that they gave up on those things or didn't pursue those things, especially when they married and became mothers. Um, the middle class women, especially who um, hadn't gone to college or who dropped out really felt a deep sense of loss. And part of that's accentuated by the fact that they're living in a university community. So they're keenly aware of that, of that loss as middle-class women. There are gonna be a couple of other themes too uh, in late life, uh, just the, the desire to resume creative interests that they had set aside um, when they uh, had and cared for children. So there's a kind of reclaiming of interests from uh, uh, and passions from early in life uh, in the later years. And again, just um, taking more time to appreciate relationships and to appreciate some of life's daily pleasures. Looking back on um, what they talk about as the most and least satisfying years, the depression decade, which was a long and relentless decade, um, really emerges as the worst time in life. Uh, it's unchallenged, <laughs> but it has a double-edged quality. Um, so on the one hand, no single decade has a more profound effects on health and well-being in later life than, than the Depression decade, as Glenn was just saying. Um, uh, so that's going to be kind of one of the, uh, that's going to be a sharp edge of that double-edged sword. Um, it's going to trigger this deep theme of, of loss in the lives of this generation. And yet the other side of that sword um, that, uh, is that really the depression is also going to trigger a lot of memory um, about how this was a time of building families and some of the pleasures that came with it. Um, that hard times were also bringing families together as much as they were also pulling them apart. And we don't have time today to talk about how these families managed the, uh, that uh, decade together, um, but we, we can uh, address that. Finally, when they look back on life, they see the most satisfying times being from the 20s to the 60s. Part of that is because children will, uh, will get talked about as being a primary source of satisfaction, uh, the greatest source of satisfaction. Men and women are gonna talk about it in different ways. So women are gonna be three times more likely than men to re report having children as a reason for satisfaction, first of all. <laughs> um, but they're, they're gonna recall the early years, the children's very earliest years um, as, as the most satisfying. Whereas men instead are gonna recall the years where they're seeing their children get um, launch their, um, com and complete their education, get married and enter their own careers. So uh, you see a, a kind of gender difference in how uh, women and men talk about children as becoming satisfying and when it is that they see as the most satisfying years. Um, also, I guess I, I just say that, um, that you see this, uh, this trend also in marriage, um, that there's a kind of revealing portrait of marriage um, over time. And uh, couples look back and especially see the, um, the 20s as a as, a, as an ideal time. And maybe it's not so surprising because um, their, their marriages are still relatively new. They're still in the early years of family formation. Um, uh, if, if they've even started that. Um, and so I think it's, um, it, it's, it's maybe um, not a surprise that they recall those years, especially before the depression as being some of the most satisfying from a family standpoint. I'll stop there. Um, let me uh, stop sharing my screen. And um, there we are, we're all together. Wow, thank you so much, everybody. I mean, this is just a very rich book. There's so much in there. We could probably go on for three hours to try to even capture a little bit of, of what the book uh, portrays. We do have some Q&A questions that I wanna queue up and then I have a few questions and I'll keep looking. So if you have more questions, put them in. Um, a couple of them are process questions, but I'll start with the one that's not. And the first question was, were race differences considered in this study? And the person said, it looks like based on the photos that all the participants were white. Is that true? Oh, yes. I'll answer that. <laughs> <laughs> because I've gotten it many times. But uh, I think when you um, look at a longitudinal study, and the composition, you need to begin with when they were selected and the world in which 
these children were selected. Uh, because at that time, Berkeley was, I think of it as old Berkeley. It was largely, uh, almost entirely white with very few Mexican uh, immigrants, uh, black immigrants or uh, entrants uh, to the city came in during the war. Uh, the war was just totally tra transformed the composition of Berkeley. And if you were to launch a study in the post-war years, it would be a different story in terms of diversity. Uh, so that point. Great. Did you, did you want to say something more about that, Rick? Um, no, just to say, though, that they, um, they were somewhat representative of the kinds of families that had come to California. Oh, yes. At that and, time. Um, and so in that sense, it does re reflect also. So from our vantage point now, we might look back um, and, and think about, um, about these questions in a, in a deep way, especially as we're starting a sample. Um, but for the time, they really did represent California. And in that sense, they were also diverse. They had come from many places, their families of origin, including abroad. Um, and in the second chapter, we really trace uh, those migration stories to California so that we understand how it is that these people landed there. Yeah, good point. Nice. So there's two process questions I want you to quickly address. And the first one is from David Reisman. He asks, how did you manage writing the book? Did each chapter have a primary author with input from others or were the chapters really co-written? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I can start. I don't <laughs> I, um, I, when I discovered this um, longitudinal study, I um, saw a way to outline a book uh, this was 72, 73. And um, I began to work on each of these chapters. Um, the, chap the chapter composition of the book has changed a lot um, because um, uh, we needed to, uh, we needed to focus on, for example, the opening chapter that depended on getting all those intervening in, uh, uh, chapters done. And um, I must say, um, uh, you can see children of the Great Depression in a lot of what I've tried to do here. I, um, I've always been interested in social change in lives. I think that is due to the fact that I grew up in Cleveland and in the middle of the depression. And um, I moved, my parents moved me to rural Pennsylvania. And if you want a shot, all you need to do is move from inner city or uh, a big complex city to a farm, to a dairy farm. And that, totally transformed my interest. I, it made me very interested in context. And uh, I graduated from Penn State in agricultural science, but never um, went into that field at all. I was just basically uh, sociology, psychology, combination of the two. And um, uh, so, that's kind of how I, I really, you can see in the, in the book, um, the focus on economic deprivation, the depression, the war. I could, I had no way of dealing with the war because in the um, children of the Great Depression, they never collected any information on that. So uh, I had, it took another 15 years to bring information back, uh, I, I launched a, a survey, a retrospective life history survey to collect information on the war period. But um, uh, so this became larger than life. Uh, 
because the, the territory was way beyond the archive itself. And um, I think you, you can see uh, uh, Rick uh, worked on a chapter on, on uh, Berkeley uh, during the war. And of course, uh, Gene McFarland had absolutely no interest in, in collecting contextual information and the and the uh, an account of how the community was transformed by the war but that was central to our purpose of trying to understand how um, the impact of the war transformed families and lives and uh, Rick can you can talk about some of those additions and supplements uh, that were were made along all along the line, and of course, Lisa um, uh, made all kinds of contributions along the way, but especially in family and and work and uh, our women's lives. And uh, so, those are areas that they can talk about. Uh, but well, luckily, um, you know. Jean McFarland was a clinical psychologist. So at the time, it's probably not surprising that she wasn't that interested in context. Whereas yes. you were inventing life course theory and how context is so very important for really understanding human lives. And yeah. so um, I think, you know. It was a good was marriage. It was a good marriage. Yeah. 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 That's one of the things we really um, most love and appreciate about the book is how contextual it is down to yeah. the understanding Berkeley, the city of Berkeley, the Bay Area, California, the nation. Um, yeah. I mean, all of these layers that we, we actually try to build into really do right by uh, context. And that was a whole uh, journey of its own. Um, and um, bringing out how to, how to work together, how to write together, how to, yeah. uh, how to reanalyze uh, the archival data, how to how to get new archival data and, and bring it in. I mean, there were lots of uh, great puzzles in this process. So we, uh, we kind of joke that the, um, the record, we, we did so much of this weekly phone calls. I mean, year after year after year. <laughs> and we have an archive of the, of the meeting notes from those meetings that's like a, 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 an important archive in its own right, just as, the, as all the uh, ideas were, were unfolding. Yeah leads me to an, the next question, which is actually about archives. And Wendy Hine, who works with the 4-H program here at OSU, um, I won't read her whole question because it's kind of long, but basically her question is, you know, they get, they get great stories and they collect this stuff, very rich material, you know, and the university says, oh, just keep things for a couple of years, then shred them or get rid of oh, them. Oh, dear. And, and she, her question, I think it's a very a good one is, you know, how long? I mean, how do we decide what to archive, what not to archive, you know? Uh, yeah, and the costs, the costs associated with archiving, the space needed uh, for archiving. Well, you know, or the or the the process of having to digitize things. Yeah. Well, this is my this is a big crusade for me uh, because I I've seen so many archives thrown away. Mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, I would, I'll never forget um, calling August Hollingshead uh, because he wrote Elmtown's Youth uh, basically during World War II. And I wanted to know what he had saved and where the archive is and so on. He said he had just burned it or something like that. <laughs> that was devastating. I mean, it, and I, I see a lot of, I saw a lot of it at Berkeley um, because the Institute no longer exists as it did before. The materials have been moved, uh, taken different places. Uh, and so uh, you, I really feel that there needs to be an Institute that deals with um, invaluable information, you know, collecting this, if you throw it away, that's it. And that's the, the thing about this particular project, this book, because um, we put together materials uh, 
and told the story about a generation's life, basically. Um, and we want to make sure that the materials are saved and institutionalized. And I, I think that's true for all the interviews, uh, the interviews of, of the uh, men and women uh, who grew up in these families. Um, uh, we have those uh, saved and everything, but um, we have some hair racing stories to tell about uh, pursuing a, a body of uh, literature or um, materials, archival materials, and discovering at the end that they were just tossed out, uh, just thrown away. So um, I think the value of an archive is in the mind of the person coming to the archive. And that's the problem. You see, most people don't necessarily see any value in keeping these materials. Um, but you get the right person and they see all kinds of possibilities. And I think that was certainly true of Jean McFarland's interviews. Um, she really never pursued or got people to work with those materials. Um, so much of it had never been used. Uh, you know, she was interested in the children and following them, not the parents. And that's, that is in many ways the big story here that all these data on the parents were sitting in files and had not really been used and had not been coded. And that's part of the reason it took 40, 50 years going, doing all of this, uh, getting the, the materials in a way organized so that one could make something of them. And uh, so it's it's been a wonderful experience for me. I mean, it's a lifetime experience. And a lot of people would say, gosh, why did you do that? I mean, the, the turnover requirement to produce work very fast uh, is not going to be met by our people working in archives because you have to put so much time into it. But it's, I can't imagine a more rewarding uh, enterprise. You have to stay alive though uh, in institutions like ours. And so I had other things going on at the same time. That's yeah. also why it took so long, <laughs> probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some archives, uh, Carolyn Alden reminded reminded us that the Murray Institute at Radcliffe Col College used to, at least used to collect archives. I don't know if they still are, but there, mm -hmm. there was an archive, uh, right. archival collection there. Yes. Um, let me ask you a question um, about parenting, since you brought up how rich, you know, the parents are here. And it was really during their generation that parenting went from being just, oh, the kids grew up and we hope they turned out okay, to this very intensive form of parenting, parenting style, in which the children are really, in some ways, the center of family life, and um, that there are now experts, you know, child development experts, in the right ways to parent. Uh, and that I think in reading the books, a lot of the mothers said this created a lot of anxiety for them. And I was wondering if you can talk about why this tr transition occurred and how it may still affect the lives of mothers and fathers today. Rick, that's your ball game. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I, uh, so Catherine Stroppel circulated a blog that the three of us wrote um, and that came out on the society pages about this very topic. But um, yeah, chapter 12, especially, um, Kind of charts the rise of uh, of kind of ch uh, child science and the 1920s really become so this is one of the ways in which this generation does become the sort of hinge between the past and the and the present um maybe the most profound one um the sort of um and of course they're part of a study called the child guidance study which is also an important backdrop here um 
But the 1920s uh, uh, really marked the emergence of the, of, of the science of the child and of child development. And even more, this is a time when um, funds from the Rockefeller uh, uh, Foundation basically established more than a dozen, I think, uh, child centers at universities across the country. And those centers, and Berkeley was one of them, were charged basically with doing great science on the children in order to, um, to, to serve the development of children and to serve the development of uh, parents um, and, uh, and to guide the child, the guidance study was to help guide parents in, the, in their roles as parents. Um, so it was, it was something we talk about today happening then, starting then about how you leverage science and put it into, into um, practice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there are a couple of things. This is, this is the place where, um, where, if you, where you read the excerpts and if you didn't know that these were parents who are um, talking about their experiences in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, you would think they were straight out of today. Um, and so you, you see this sort of um, the seeds of what we now talk about as intensive parenting in this, um, in this generation. Um, uh, so they see these advan uh, revolutionary advances in, in uh, the quality and amount of child rearing advice that starts in the 20s and it keeps evolving in the 30s and the 40s. Um, they get the sense that being a good parent is, is a skill that you have to master. Uh, they get the sense, as you just said, uh, Karen, that there's a, there's a dark side to knowing more. And that is that you feel more anxious yeah. about, um, about your incompetence as a parent and about what you might do wrong um, uh, it, it, and how it might affect uh, kid outcomes in negative ways. Um, they're becoming more conscious about the roles of fathers. Um, and many of these men wanna be better fathers and husbands. Um, they're talking so much about how do you navigate, how do you, um, how do you raise kids in a, in a world that you don't understand, um, right? That's so different from your own childhood. And we, we've joked that, uh, I mean, so often it almost seems scripted. Many of these parents, especially in the Warriors, talk about the corrupt influence of the movies. Uh, the movies are a place that you go to and cause mischief at, um, but, but they're also sending new messages to kids uh, that, uh, that parents have more concerns about the moral influence of the movies. You could substitute the internet for most of those quotes and you'd think they, they were relevant today. So I think that one of the things that was really so surprising to us is just how modern these parents sound, despite the fact that in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, as, they're, as we're reading their transcripts, um, you know, you, 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 you're, you're reminded of the fact that their worlds seem also so far away from where we are today. Lisa, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I was just gonna say, it's also important to remember that 38% of the women in this um, group went to college for some time and they were taking classes in this. Their, you know, classes and oh, majors yeah. and so on were tracked in, in more female type. Um, topics and so and society I think is invested in first invested in education but then invested in a way that women can get education but not to go work yeah. <laughs> so that they're driving this sort of desire to specialize in the domestic sphere so I think that's also part of what feeds it yeah mm -hmm. well we are we have about two maybe one and a half minutes left and so I wanted to let everybody know before I thank you all that if you uh, would like to read this book or, or get your own copy, uh, the local independent, one of the local independent bookstores, Grassroots, has copies. So you can request one from them. And we also had the raffle. So I wanted to um, let you all know who won the free copy of the book. And that is Ghulam al -Makizi. I'm sorry, I said you probably didn't get your name quite right. But Gulam, you can email um, Gretchen your address where you'd like to have the book sent. And I believe it'll be sent straight from the publisher. So congratulations to you. I want to end today by saying that um, we really appreciate having Lisa, Glenn, Rick spend an hour with us. And I'm sure they would be, if you wanted to email them, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, although I think we hit all of them, except maybe Carolyn Aldwin, you might wanna, since you know Glenn, you can email him your question. Um, she, 
it was great to see you and thank you so much. Yeah. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.